Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Matt Abbott, and I'm the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you all, and especially our members, for joining us for today's On the Record program. Before we start the conversation, please note that the Council is a nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. We will take questions from the audience after our moderated discussion. If you'd like to submit a question, please type ccga.live into your web browser. I'm now honored to introduce today's speakers. Ambassador Robert Gallucci previously served as US Ambassador at Large and Special Envoy for the US Department of State, focused on the nonproliferation of ballistic missiles and weapons of mass destruction. He was the chief US negotiator during the North Korean nuclear crisis of 1994. He also served as Dean of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and president of the MacArthur Foundation. Ambassador Christopher Hill is a former career diplomat, a four-time ambassador nominated by three presidents whose last post was as ambassador to Iraq in 2009. Previously, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2005 until 2009 during which he was also the head of the US delegation to the six party talks on the North Korean nuclear issue. And our moderator today is Jean Lee, who is the director of the Wilson Center's Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy, and currently serves as co-host of the Lazarus Heist podcast for the BBC World Service. She led the Associated Press News Agency's coverage of the Korean Peninsula as bureau chief from 2008 to 2013. And in 2011, she became the first American reporter granted extensive access on the ground in North Korea. In January 2012, opening AP's Pyongyang Bureau, the only US text and photo news bureau based in the North Korean capital. She has made dozens of extended reporting trips to North Korea, visiting farms, factories, schools, military academies, and homes in the course of her exclusive reporting across the country. Thank you and welcome to all of our distinguished guests. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to the Chicago Council. It is my pleasure to be joined today by Ambassador Gallucci and Ambassador Hill. Each of them devoted months and actually years negotiating with the North Koreans in the course of their illustrious diplomatic careers. And each of them negotiated landmark, if not sustained nuclear deals that I hope we'll hear a bit more about today. So I can't think of any two people more equipped, better equipped to help us understand the task that lies before the Biden administration when it comes to North Korea. And based on their backdrops, it may be, we may get a piano recital and an art performance as well. So let's see what happens. So North Korea, I must say, has been somewhat quiet in recent months. So I'd like to just spend a few minutes catching us up on where things stand in July 21. So we have a bit of a, a backdrop for the discussion today. It's been three years since Kim Jong-un stepped out onto the world stage in 2018 with a series of summits with the South Korean president, then President Donald Trump in Singapore, of course, and subsequently with the leaders of China and Russia. Quite a heady coming out for Kim Jong-un. And I should remind you that that year, we also saw Kim Jong-un's sister visit South Korea for the Winter Olympics. And we saw the South Korean president and South Korean pop stars travel to the North Korean capital. So these were huge propaganda moments for Kim Jong-un, but I would argue that they did not produce any breakthroughs on denuclearization. And perhaps our speakers can uh, let me know what they think. And for Kim, I would say he, you know, he didn't get any alleviation of sanctions, what it is what he was pushing for. So in, in February 2019, we had Kim and Trump meet again in Hanoi. Huge fanfare, huge expectations, I think, on both sides of a nuclear deal after just a few weeks of negotiation. Uh, but those talks failed. And apart from a handshake and a chat at the DMZ later that year, negotiations have been at a standstill. We've seen North Korea retreat into a kind of self-imposed isolation with the leadership uh, working out uh, a new strategy, and I think waiting to see the results of our presidential election last year. And then, of course, we had the, the COVID pandemic, which, which prompted North Korea to do its best to seal its borders in January 2020, uh, sealing it from the flow of traffic and goods and people. And 18 months later, if I've done my math right, the country still has not opened up. Uh, North Korea is more isolated than I can ever remember with these 
growing signs that the regime is tightening the cordon of control over the people as their economic situation worsens. And I, and I do want to mention that in Seoul, we have President Moon Jae-in in, in the last month of his five-year term. Uh, Ambassador Hill, I'm hoping that you can provide some insight on what that means. Uh, he has pledged, he had pledged to make engaging North Korea a hallmark of his presidency, but Kim Jong-un isn't giving him the time of day. Uh, but Kim Jong-un is, however, reaffirming his ties with China and other communist allies. And I think that's something that bears mention today as well. And in the meantime, Washington, in Washington, we've got the Biden administration completing its much anticipated North Korea policy review, which I'd like you, both of your thoughts on. Uh, we had a few highlights uh, revealed during President Biden's May summit with President Moon, including the appointment of an envoy in North Korea, Ambassador Sung Kim, uh, who will be carrying out that role from um, uh, Indonesia. And uh, I would say that the Biden administration appears to be focused on other pressing domestic and foreign policy priorities, but he's left, uh, the, the administration has left the door open to North Korea foreign engagement at the same time as they've reinforced the importance of enforcing sanctions. But the North Koreans haven't jumped at the chance to restart negoti negotiations. So where, where did things go from here? How do we get the North Koreans back to the table? And what can we expect? Uh, what should we keep in mind from your past negotiations? And how may things be different today than they were in, in 1994 and in the 2000s? So I'd like to invite each of you to weigh in with some initial opening thoughts before we dig a little deeper. And I'd also like to inv invite the viewers to pose questions through the website. I believe that website is ccga.live. And uh, we're sure to, we'll be sure to get to those at the half hour mark. So let us start with Ambassador Hill, if you could share with us uh, some initial thoughts, particularly given how well you know South Korea from your time as US ambassador to Seoul. Well, thank you very much, Jane. That was a tremendous synopsis of kind of where we are. Uh, but of course, uh, whenever we kind of calculate where we are, it's kind of difficult to extrapolate on where we will be because uh, one can expect surprises in dealing with North Korea. One moment, uh, it looks pretty, uh, you know, the whole process seems moribund, and then next thing you know, uh, something happens. So I think one has to kind of keep a certain sense of modesty about uh, predicting uh, the future on, uh, with respect to North Korea. I think one of the questions we all ask is, uh, uh, on whose side does time favor? And uh, I think, uh, you know, it's often been said, well, the North Koreans are doing well, they're, you know, breaking out of their isolation, they're able to do some things while the U.S. side doesn't really know what to do. I would actually differ, I beg to differ at this point. I, I don't think too many things are going well for North Korea. We haven't gotten around to the sort of critical uh, uh, rainy months of uh, August and September. We know that they've had a lot of food problems. They may have more food problems and we don't know what the weather is. And certainly if you can gauge it by what's going on in the rest of the world, whether you're in Belgium or uh, Western United States, it's very uh, hard to predict. And uh, the North Koreans seem very at a loss to kind of deal with those issues. So that's uh, one point I'd make. Um, you know, the sanctions, uh, traditionally people always argue, are they really effective? Are they working? Are they being properly implemented? Well, I'll tell you what has been properly implemented and that is COVID. Um, you know, North Korea has been shut off uh, like no sanction program has ever succeeded because of, uh, because of COVID. So we're gonna have to watch that, uh, you know, as we, as we go forward. As for the Biden administration, uh, you know, uh, in the early part of the uh, of the Obama administration, there was certainly an effort to see if things could get going again. A sense that perhaps some of the progress, which I, I you know, in full disclosure, I was working on this issue right into the beginning of the Obama administration. They felt that perhaps with a new a new team in Washington, North Korea would be willing to be more reasonable on issues such as uh, verification, which was a big problem. You know, uh, we could not have a situation where uh, they pretend to denuclearize or we pretend to believe them. Um, so the, the Obama administration went into this and found that it was pretty difficult to get progress. And they settled on this term, uh, this uh, strategic patience 
I mean, patience is supposed to be a virtue. And if you put the word strategic in front of it, it sounds like a very big virtue. But the fact is, not a lot was uh, went forward. So I think as the Biden administration looks at this, they're probably looking at you know what what can be done, and they certainly look at the Iran situation, uh, which is tense, which is uh, kind of moving to a crisis in some respects. But still, if if you're an odds maker, you would say, hey, we could probably get more done on the Iran situation. So I think North Korea, this North Korea situation may have to get in get into line. Uh, certainly. Uh, the relationship with the ROK, South Korea is very important to the Biden administration already. Moon Jae-in was in Washington uh, very early on, one of the first people to do that. I think that was very useful, but uh, we'll have to see because South Korea is going to shut down pretty soon as they get ready for their elections. Thank you. I already have a million questions for you, but let's give Ambassador Gallucci a chance to weigh in and, and perhaps to offer some of his thoughts on on the North Korea policy review in particular. And you know, for you, I'm I'm wondering, does it feel like Groundhog Day or do you see some do you see a way ahead? Do you see a glimmer of hope uh, with this new policy that we've we've seen? Well, uh, Gene, thank you. Uh, I thought your introduction, as Chris said, was really wonderful. It it does set set the scene. And where it puts us, I think, is not in a particularly exciting place, which is a welcome change. Uh, usually when, um, I, don't, I can't speak for Chris, but when I'm in, invited to such an occasion, it's because the North Koreans have just done something, and it's usually something bad, and we're commenting on a missile launch or nuclear weapons test or a provocation to the South or something like that. In contrast, two days ago when I was looking forward to being with you all, uh, this afternoon, I was wondering uh, sort of what we'd talk about, uh, because uh, nothing has been happening for a bit. Uh, I mean, you, you would like me to go back and talk about the latest big thing that's happened, which was the U.S. policy review, which for a lot of us was not much. I mean, it wasn't bad. As a matter of fact, that was the news. Uh, we didn't rediscover strategic patience that Chris mentioned. Uh, we didn't discover symmetry in the last administration. We discovered um, business-like, serious approach to this problem, which is not exactly news. Uh, but we do have news because uh, yesterday we got word that uh, the, the Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, was going to stop in China. He, she was going to Asia anyway, but stop in China and see the foreign minister. And among the things she would talk about, uh, I, it was advertised as best I could tell as the deputy secretary would talk about the areas of agreement between us and China, which is getting smaller and smaller as a, as a uh, bit of landscape. And, and that, but one thing we think we have a certain amount of agreement over is uh, that we do not wish the Korean Peninsula to turn into a war zone. Um, I'm putting it that way because I, I don't think that the United States of America and China have congruent interests in Northeast Asia or on the Korean Peninsula or even with respect to just the North Korean regime. However, I don't think the Chinese are amused when the uh, North Koreans in the past have done something provocative. They're not amused when we feel we need to do something to demonstrate containment and deterrence and our alliance with the South, they would just assume these things not happen. And that makes them s seem to be, intermittently at least, um, midwives to, or a midwife to, uh, to discussions between DPRK and USA. And I think that's probably on the mind of the Deputy Secretary, uh, that this could be an opportunity to have us move off uh, dead center. Uh, and we have been, it seems to me, a, a dead center since the US policy review, which didn't offer anything dramatically new. If the North was hoping that the Biden administration would lead with sanctions relief or something in which they get something first, they were disappointed. Uh, and very recently, uh, some of us were reassured by the Biden administration that they would remain disappointed in that connection. They would not be suggesting sanctions relief absent progress on denuclearization. So we are in a little bit of a dead zone. 
Uh, and that leads us back to one of Chris's very good questions. And that is, well, when you're in a dead zone, who's winning? You know, who needs progress more? And I would say we both can live with this situation, although the, the, I have been told, and you both on either side of me on my screen know more about this than I, but the situation in North in economic terms and the condition of the people is not good. In addition to COVID, uh, it is not good. So the, the sanctions regime is hurting, even though they can circumvent it. Uh, and I'm sure they would like, if they could get to where they want to get to, like to have those sanctions removed. They would like normalization. The question is, how do we get from where we are to there? Um, the last thing that happened was failing to do that in Hanoi in 2019. And the question is, can we figure out the formula for simultaneity in moves by both sides? So thank you. Am I right then in understanding that you believe that the US shouldn't make a first gesture or offer a first initial consent? Au contraire. Um, I, okay. I, don't, I don't know that, um, I don't know that uh, any substantial move on sanctions is a bright idea. It might mislead the North into thinking that uh, the US was going to be an easier uh, partner in all this under a, a President Biden than under a Trump or an Obama. And we, I don't think that would be, I don't think that's accurate. I don't think we want to send that signal. But I think there may be matters of form that have simultaneity expressed in one side going first. And as a North Korean one said to me at a track two meeting, we don't understand why you guys can't go first. You're the big player on the block. You're the superpower. We're this little state in Northeast Asia in the corner, and you're expecting to us to have equity with you on moves. We think you ought to make the gesture. I, I don't think that's a bad point. I, I think we could afford to make the gesture. And I would, uh, I would suggest we do that. If, if, in fact, we get reason to believe uh, that would be enough of an incentive for to the North to really engage, because we need early on, I don't want to avoid making or fail to make this point, we need early on substantive moves on the denuclearization side. And at Hanoi, they were offering substantive moves, and we failed to take what was offered on offer. I believe that was a mistake on our part. Uh, and I think if we can go back that direction, it wouldn't be all bad. Now, we haven't seen the North Greens respond positively, but we haven't seen them respond negatively either. And you're somebody who has watched North Green responses and certainly engaged with them in these track two talks away from the official state media. What do you make of the statement that, it was, that the, uh, the review was well received? Are you seeing signals that they are that they may be open to coming back to the negotiating table, or and what and and, and just to, to add on to that, what would is there a step that you could propose that would be a, a I don't want to call it a concession, but a a gesture that the U.S. could make to kind of open that door that wouldn't have consequences uh, so, in terms of security. Th this is really not that hard. I mean, I, I'm, I, but I don't, I don't want to be the person that's going to say, we do this, they should do that. Uh, if you look at UN sanctions, US sanctions, and look at what sanctions apply to when it's human rights and, and when it's the proliferation issue, when it's ballistic missiles, we can look over that menu and we can find something. Um, and remember, we're talking about sanctions uh, which are circumvented with great skill uh, and effectiveness. Uh, the New York Times uh, piece not too long ago was very good on just how exactly the North Koreans do this. Uh, and so we, we don't, this is not a big substantive concession. I don't want to pick which one of those little pieces you do, but we could just do one of those if, in fact, we're encouraged to, to believe by the North and that we can communicate in lots of different ways, New York Channel, other channels through the Chinese, not through the Chinese, lots of ways of communicating. And they can say, okay, we would then have our representatives meet. I mean, so it's, this is, you know, there's an expression, this is not rocket science. 
this is not rocket <laughs> science. Uh, no pun intended. No pun intended. Uh, th this can be accomplished uh, even by diplomats. And I think you're referring to the, uh, in terms of the reports of the ship, uh, ship to ship transfers offshore, which, which right. do manage to, so we are certainly seeing uh, reports that uh, from satellite, based on satellite imagery of North Korea finding and, and other countries finding ways to get around the international sanctions. On that point, I'd like to um, ask Ambassador Hill uh, uh, to, you know, we do have the deputy secretary in the region. We did see the report from Seoul last night. And I think the statement that she and her counterpart in South Korea said that they would, was that they would agree to continue close cooperation at, at every level. So perhaps a sign that communication and collaboration between the United States and South Korea is back on track after uh, some tensions during the Trump administration. And she, they, the State Department has announced that she will be meeting with Chinese officials. This is something that we was unclear when they first issued her itinerary. Uh, and it looks like she will be meeting with somebody you know very well, Wang Yi. Uh, so I'm curious, I have a, a question for you, which is how does how does China fit into this? And this is really part of the, China has to be part of this dis discussion about engaging North Korea. Do you see that it might be possible? Uh, will North Korea be on the agenda? It, is it possible to bring China on board with a broader regional North Korea strategy? And does this start to sound like the six party talks? Is there any potential for bringing that mechanism and that uh, negotiating platform back into play. Yeah, I uh, I don't think the problem is the negotiating platform. And I think when things aren't moving substantively, people kind of look at the negotiating platform. Do we need two? Do we need four? Do we need six? Do we need 66? Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think the issue uh, remains very substantive, which is the North Koreans are not prepared to engage in a process that uh, is about denuclearization. They're prepared to uh, engage in a broader concept of uh, bilateral relations. And uh, if their so-called sense of, uh, of, or their feeling of our hostility and their, in their view goes away, then maybe they can talk nuclear weapons. So they, they we're not there yet on the substance, but I think it's very important that uh, Deputy uh, Secretary Sherman uh, talk to Wang Yi and to get from the Chinese some sense of what the North Koreans might want to do. The Chinese always talk about sort of step by step. And, uh, you know, when you were talking earlier with Ambassador Gallucci about the issue of, you know, we do something, they do something. I mean, no one's asking for a leap of faith. No one's saying, okay, I'll jump if you jump, and then the other guy doesn't jump and you're uh, in a free fall. So people are talking about kind of small things that could be done and could be set up in private in some sort of choreographed uh, way. And so if the Chinese wanted to or felt that there was a way to get things going, they could say, look, we can deliver the North Koreans to do this. Would you be prepared to do that? And keep it at a, at a level such that if the North Koreans don't do their step, no one perceives it as a, some great uh, you know, loss of face on the United States. Uh, you know, I think the Biden administration does need to be careful on this because there are a lot of, uh, you know, this is a pretty fraught political uh, time in our country. And if there's a perception that somehow Biden administration was too weak in dealing with North Korea, I mean, he would, he would not hear the end of it. And the argument that, well, look at what happened in Singapore, or accurately look at what didn't happen in Singapore, that's just so, you know, in the new cycle world, that is so far in the past, no one's noticing. So they do have to be careful. But I really think the Chinese could play a role in terms of delivering the North Koreans to do something. What we don't want is a situation where we have done something just for the purpose of getting them back to the talks because uh, you know they should want the talks as much as we do. And so you have to be a little careful that you're not just giving something to someone just to talk to you. So it's a, it's a, it's a tall order and I can see why they think uh, you know dealing with the Ayatollah might be easier. Where do you think the North Korea issue fits into that agenda given what we heard from Kurt Campbell, for example, about how this is a different era of US-China strategic competition. Will they get, to, will those discussions get to a point? Of course, we don't know, I'm not there, uh, but will these discussions get to the point where they talk about cooperation and collaboration on North Korea? Or could that be an opening for cooperation between the US and China? 
I think uh, there have been signals from the Biden administration that they understand that uh, we can't just be staring at the Chinese and, you know, in some, uh, you know, marriage counseling. We've got to look at some other issues that somehow we can cooperate on, uh, albeit the, as Bob suggested, the scope is fairly small right now. But if you can find some areas where you can work together in some kind of pattern of cooperation, that would be helpful. Um, but I think uh, there are some huge issues that, uh, that you allude to. I mean, the whole Indo-Pacific thing, uh, I mean, that is a very big, big issue for the Chinese. And it looks a lot to some of them like a U.S. effort to engage in encirclement. And, uh, you know, you don't have to play the game of Go to understand why the Chinese think about encirclement all the time. So, you know, they'll, they'll want to talk about that. And... Uh, and our answer is, oh no, we're talking about broader political and economic space. And I don't know if they're buying it. So uh, at some point that elephant in the room needs to be at least described in the same terms by the different sides. And then we'll see what can be, uh, how we can handle it. I must say, uh, it's not a good time to be sitting down with the Chinese and talking about even areas that we agree, we agree on because there is a mountain of mistrust right now. And I don't think the Biden administration really wants to put itself in the sort of um, mode of reaching out to the Chinese and being seen as weak. Sadly, in our country, uh, foreign policy uh, is, a, is a kind of proxy variable for how tough you are. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's one of those times where it's, it's going to be tough to make progress with uh, countries like North Korea. I think that's a very good point. And I know Ambassador Gallucci knows the consequences of the political climate impinging on whatever negotiations you have worked out. This was certainly something you dealt with in 1994 with the Republicans taking over Congress, if I recall correctly, and some elements of the deal that you negotiated not being carried out on the US side. Is that right? Do, um, I, do I recall that correctly? I'm going to want to be careful here because I do. Uh, when we're writing the history, and it's been written a few times uh, about what happened to the agreed framework of 1994, um, I think it, one interpretation is that, as you said, when the Republicans took over both houses of Congress, uh, it became a tad bit more difficult uh, to implement elements of the agreement which declared the U.S. as enthusiastic about normalizing relations with the DPRK. I think so. We had a hard time fulfilling uh, the language in the preamble of that agreement. But I think that's quite different from uh, what the North Koreans did, which the nicest word to be used to characterize it is they hedged, which is to say they cheated. They, they made a secret deal with Islamabad uh, to get uranium enrichment technology uh, as a hedge against the loss of their plutonium route to nuclear weapons. So I would say, I, I'm not trying to lawyer this one, but theirs was quite a material breach of the deal. And ours was, I think, in form from the North Korean perspective, also material, because remember, this is a matter of the North Koreans get normalization, we get denuclearization. That's the way it's been characterized. Uh, and they didn't see normalization. They saw uh, the Republicans were very tough on the heavy fuel oil that was to be delivered from us. The, the pace of the, of the construction of the light water reactors wasn't what they thought it should be, et cetera. So they did have complaints. And I'm not saying they weren't serious complaints, but I don't think a rise to the level that the North Korean departure from the requirements of the deal actually rose to. So we might say that some of this is an issue of trust. Do we need to have trust in this relationship with the North Koreans in order to have successful, a successful nuclear deal? Or, or can we accept, and you know, this was true for me in my own tiny little negotiation, I think that for me it was respect, but I just assumed that we weren't going to trust and that was fine. I'm curious what you, how you feel after going through this process with the North Korean. Thank you. you can even probably see, even with only this little Hollywood square that we're on here, um, I get nervous over the word trust uh, in international negotiations. And I've done 
than with a number of other countries. Uh, certainly with North Korea, I don't think that's an appropriate word to use other than as a goal to get to a relationship in which there's some amount of trust between states. There is a phrase you must have heard, uh, trust but verify. It's a phrase I have never understood. It's from the Reagan era. I would say, uh, you can't trust, therefore you'd better verify. And it seems to me that's what the agreed framework was about. In other words, when there was cheating, we caught them at the cheating. That's how verification should work on a good day. The transparency gives you access and access allows you to see whether they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So no, I, I don't think trust is something that's gonna carry a lot of weight in US uh, North Korean relations for quite a long time. Eventually, yes, but there's a limit in international politics about how much one puts into trust, particularly if we're talking about a national security matter rather than let's say fishing rights. So the word verification does bring back some memories of covering Ambassador Hill <laughs> during the six party talks and the, the hangups that, uh, that he had over verification issues. Now I'm going to turn to some of the uh, questions that are pouring in. Uh, and there is one for Ambassador Hill. Why does North Korea not see a path to normal relations with the rest of the world? You've spent so long dealing with North Korea. How do you manage to have any optimism? <laughs> and then I'm going to add one more question, which I think is for both of you and perhaps Ambassador Hill, you can, you can also add this one. What lessons did you learn during your negotiations with North Korea? Small question, but I think this is going to be of great interest. So please go ahead. You know, I would, um... Maybe I answer that second question, referring to the previous conversation. I think the extent to which you can do small things, step by step, uh, you can create some measure of, I, like Bob, I hate the word trust, but some measure of, you know, you know the other side will follow through when it's small enough. And uh, the problem is when you talk in big terms and our previous president talked in very big terms and there was no basis for saying North Korea would follow up with those gigantic steps. But I think uh, what I learned from them is when you, when you work on a very kind of incremental basis, uh, there's no reason to expect them not to follow through on some small issue. Uh, so, I think there's a way to negotiate with them. Uh, I think uh, the concept of kind of, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, when Reagan was talking about trust and verification, he was talking big picture stuff. There's no big picture stuff with the North Koreans. There's no such thing as a, as a small issue for them either. But I think what you have to do is just go very incrementally and see if you can build up a pattern of following each other through these incremental steps. So would you call that transactional? I would say very transactional, but with the concept that you're leading towards something bigger than that. And, and uh, which is why some of the, um, the atmospherics do matter. I mean, when I was going out there and I'd get instructions not to uh, toast in the presence, uh, toast a glass in the presence of North Koreans or not to shake hands and certainly not to smile. Those kinds of things were really uh, not helpful to what we were trying to get done. So I think atmosphere uh, does matter perhaps more than this concept of trust. And as for why the North Koreans live in this splendid isolation, they've had opportunities to kind of break out of it. Um, I, I just don't think they, uh, see the idea of engaging with the world as something that will enhance their future. I think quite to the contrary, they see countries coming to them, giving them things, maybe have having concessions along the lines of sort of early 19th century uh, um, diplomacy in East Asia. I think they understand those things. Um, and I think they ultimately feel that if they really try to engage with the world and open them up, they wouldn't last very long. And frankly, um, that's, uh, that's a view that I think uh, has some merit. Do you, and this is another question, do you feel it was prudent for President Trump to meet with Kim Jong-un? You know, and I would add to that, has it pushed the needle forward? 
you know, there hadn't been any talks for a number of years. So I wasn't going to get into all this wonkish stuff about you need to build them up from the bottom and have your leaders beat at the end. I mean, I, I mean that's what one would do as a diplomat, but whatever. He was prepared to go to, sing, to Singapore. So, you know, I didn't have a big problem with that. Where I, I kind of lost them was in Hanoi. I know that um, the North Koreans were proposing something that was incremental that's what they do, but they were asking for all sanctions. Before saying uh, no and walking out after a few hours, it might have been interesting to say, okay, uh, Mr. Kim, I'd like to unveil a huge map of uh, Young Bion, um, you know, in the ballroom here. And I wonder if you could tell us in this idea that you're going to decommission Young Bion, what, what's going to happen to building one? Uh, and then, you know, have some experts talk about it. What's that going to happen in building two? And you know, maybe at the end of the day, they want everything for, for, not, for little and then you have to say no, but maybe we actually could have found out some detail about what goes on in this, in this compound. I remember when I went there, I was always saying, what's over there? I'd like to go visit that. Oh no, you can't visit that. I also want to see the hospital. I mean, there, you know, I think we missed an opportunity at dialogue by just saying, hey, we want big stuff, not incremental stuff. Young Beyond's just a small part of your overall program. We're out of here. And I'm, I'm not sure that was the best way to go. But one other point, when you're a negotiator and you're out there do, doing stuff, it does kind of get on your nerves when someone 10,000 miles away thinks that uh, he or she can do it better than you. And so I'll have to give the benefit of the doubt to the people who are in <laughs> actually dealing with it that day. But was it at all, and, and I don't know if Amb Ambassador Gallucci, you look like you want to say something, but was it at all surprising to you that the negotiation, I mean, shouldn't these be discussion points that are worked down in advance before the leaders sit down? Or was it shocking to you that they spent two weeks? I know you spent many, 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 many months <laughs> working out these details. I'm just curious, is this is the secret of negotiation that we don't know on, on the other side? I, I have said, put it this way, that I, we met the North Koreans before the agreed framework, framework for almost a year and a half of on and off talks, right? And the new administration comes in and decides they'll have symmetry and they'll do the deal over lunch. Oh, that's, I would say there's not much reality in that uh, if you really expect to accomplish something. Uh, what, what, what Chris was just saying made a lot of sense to me. I mean, if, if, if you can, and I was referring to the same bit at Han Hanoi, when the North offered and their foreign minister went on <laughs> TV right afterwards to say, this is exactly what we offered. We offered all of Young Beyond, right? Now that was the only source of plutonium for their weapons program. Uh, and so pretty significant. And there are a lot of buildings <laughs> at, at uh, Young Beyond, uh, more now than then, but still there were a lot. So this was something that they walked away from. I mean, it, it seems to me that there's, there are two things to be avoided. If one, lessons learned. Idealism uh, that's extreme and realism that's extreme. The extreme idealism is that we want to do everything over lunch today. We want to give everything and we want to get everything. And if we don't get everything, we're going to go for nothing. Well, they ended up with nothing. That is, a, you know, a, Yes, I guess if you can do a deal over lunch and solve a vital national security issue, it's great, but very unlikely. The second thing, the realism that we now have, and it's all over Washington, is um, not only can you not do this over lunch, you can't do it at all. The North will never give up their nuclear weapons. I don't know, Gene, whether you have heard this from uh, experts in Washington and elsewhere, but a lot of them take that position. I take the position that they may be right, but they may be wrong, uh, that we don't know. And when you don't know, you don't assume the worst. You see if you can't get something a bit better than that. So I'm still of the view that we don't know what we can get from them. That's a second point. Third point, and I did want to say this on the lessons learned part. Unfortunately, I learned this lesson a decade after I was a negotiator. And that is that the United States of America not only should want denuclearization, it should also want normalization. In other words, that which we perceive ourselves as giving them in exchange for what we get, 
we will get a lot out of normalization if normalization is defined the way it ought to be. That is to say that North Korea becomes a normal state in the international system. If they do, they will have evolved their human rights policy. They will have evolved their nuclear weapons policy, their ballistic missile policy, uh, the way they run their economy, and a whole lot of other things that would make life in Northeast Asia, and particularly on the Korean Peninsula, and particularly for our ally in the South, a lot better. So I think we ought to have an enthusiasm for normalization. It shouldn't be something we give grudgingly. Uh, and we, that's how we ought to approach it. But uh, as I said, at the time, back in the day, as we say, in 1994, I didn't want to hear about human rights. I, didn't, I had a security issue to deal with. And I really put that aside. Um, maybe that wasn't a bad idea then, but it's a terrible idea now, in my view. We, a, a normal re relationship with North Korea is unlikely if they do not evolve their human rights approach. And do you say that because obviously we know mo more about North Korea today than we did in 1994. Uh, is that because you, you're just becoming aware, you've become more aware over the years of the human rights allegations or well, because I, you've been able to look at the bigger picture <laughs> and take your eyes off that one security I, issue? I, I, I'm not sure why I'm not as ignorant now as I was then, I think. I, I do know that I have paid close attention to this issue and I have I remember hearing a, the first Secretary of State on, in the Trump administration say on his way to Asia or in Asia, we don't care how you treat your own people, we're interested in your nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a mistake and it, and it rings that way. I don't need to think about it. That's not something we should be saying. We should care about that. Like, it doesn't mean we can't have relations with a country that has a terrible human rights policy. I mean, I can think of a few countries who have a terrible human rights policy that we have good relations with on and off. Uh, and we could improve our relations with North Korea if a number of things were to happen. And I think a change in their human rights policy is one of those things. One of the questions is, of course, is North Korea ready to give up the, uh, the Korean War or the, the rationale that that provides? for building up these weapons. And so part of that calculation, of course, has to, to be made on the North Korean side. Um, Ambassador, go ahead. Go ahead, Ambassador. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, I don't think they want nuclear weapons because they didn't like the way we treated them during the Korean War. And I think we need to be very careful not to fall into the logic that somehow, gee, they're a poor defenseless little country and they need nuclear weapons to defend themselves. Uh, I think it's much more likely to be a program designed to make it uncomfortable, if not for this president or the next president, but an eventual president, uh, designed to make it uncomfortable to keep troops on the Korean Peninsula, because after all, if they have a very well-developed nuclear program, we could find our troops in the middle of it, whether it's tactical weapons or, or find our options constrained because North Korea could launch intercontinental uh, weapons. I think, I think more likely what they see in nuclear weapons is not so much so-called regime survival as one hears all the time, but rather a sort of longer term plan to make it uncomfortable for us to be in the region. And then ultimately we'll say, hey, those South Koreans, they can handle things and we'll gradually diminish our, our, our role there. So I think we need to be very careful with that. A second point I wanted to make, and I think Bob very accurately uh, defined as these two groups, this, this sort of, sort of hyper-realist groups. I mean, I used to get that stuff from the most hardline people back in Washington saying, what are you doing? They'll never give up their nuclear weapons. They have no idea how that sentiment creates in the North Koreans the view that, well, we've convinced a few of those guys, we have to be patient, we'll convince the rest of the people that we have a right to these nuclear weapons and that they should stop trying to tell us not to have them. Now, of course, this hard line view is that somehow, well, this, these negotiations are foolish, we're going to do, and then they, their sentence kind of trails off and you don't really know what they have in mind. It's usually some, you know, more sanctions or something or, or remember the bloody nose idea, you know, none of these ideas is, uh, I could even say is even half-baked. 
But what it tells the North Koreans is a certain percentage of our policy uh, class has given up on the prospect of ever getting them to give up their nuclear weapons. And that's something else we got to be real careful of. Well, I would love to continue discussing these things. I think our time is up. I will just say one thing, which is for me, uh, as somebody of Korean descent whose parents live in South Korea, I'm American, but my parents are dual citizens. I always try to advocate for you know, we do for trying to find ways to bring this country, bring these people out of that isolation and to normal, to find, entice them to uh, join the world. Uh, that will be better in the long run for the entire Korean Peninsula, for the entire Northeast Asian region. It's not gonna be easy. We can't be uh, naive about what that will take. Uh, I just want to thank both of you. I could talk to you for hours and grill you. I do want to ask you more in detail about what it was like working with these North Koreans because we do see the same North Koreans still engaged in this process today, even though we have a rotating door of diplomats handling these issues. Uh, and so your insight, your experience is so invaluable in understanding the history and also the pattern of behavior uh, and the way that they think and the way that they operate. I was disappointed that it didn't seem that your your experience was was, was uh, pulled upon in the previous administration. Maybe I'm wrong, but I do hope that uh, negotiators are leaning to you for advice and for insight. Um, it's been absolutely amazing, as always, to to hear from you. And I want to thank you. And to all the questioners who came in, I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but uh, perhaps we'll have a chance to speak to Ambassadors Colucci and Ambassador Hill. Uh, sometime again soon. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. Thank you.